All right, so morning, everybody. And uh, my name is uh, Neela Shah, and I'm a senior consultant with Poundstone. And what I'm going to uh, talk here today about are some of the security issues that are uh, fairly prevalent uh, in the uh, development industry, but uh, the development com community is not so much aware of them. So we are not talking about things like SQL injection, buffer overflows, or cross-site scripting, right? which are fairly, uh, uh, I guess the developer community has a fair amount of uh, knowledge about the same. A few subtle issues that still exist and uh, the developers don't know a lot about it. Right, so, so I guess I already spoke, spoke about the goal. The kind of motivation was that I, I, I do a lot of uh, security assessments like code reviews or black box uh, penetration tests. And a lot of times when we are discussing the findings with the development team, uh, the develop, development team are kind of surprised that we didn't even know that there could be issues like this. So, I mean, there's no way we could have even prevented it. Uh, so the idea here is to uh, educate the uh, folks about those issues, uh, which are prevalent, uh, but not a whole lot of uh, education about it. So here are the uh, main categories, right? We'll look at things like inter-process communication, synchronization, uh, or launching new processes, a few issues about cryptography, uh, a few about ActiveX controls, uh, third-party uh, controls, and thick client applications, right? So while we are uh, discussing the issues, uh, essentially the kind of approach or the layout we have is uh, we'll discuss the issue, so we'll understand what the issue is, uh, what the impact is, right? Like from a developer's point of view, okay, here's the issue, why should I care, right? What is the impact? Uh, from a bad guy's point of view, uh, what does he need to exploit it? What all things does he need to do? Uh, some of the uh, uh, recommendations as to how to fix it or the base platform uh, mitigations that are in place, and then uh, if you are a developer or an architect or a manager, right, how do you go about identifying the issue, right, at a feature level, at a code level? So uh, it's a fairly, I guess, a technical talk. Um, wherever, I guess, the uh, issue is uh, specific to Windows or Unix, I would kind of uh, break that out. Uh, so here's the first one, right, with the inter-process uh, communication uh, primitives. Uh, and the first one's kind of a socket hijacking. So sockets essentially are your uh, uh, inter-process communication primitives which are most prevalent because they are available on most operating systems. They allow you to do bi-directional uh, data transfer, right? Now, a socket is essentially identified by an IP address and a port, right? An IP address and a port get you a socket. Now, one of the, uh, one of the things about setting up a server is that you need to know the IP address. Right. Now, that can be a little bit of pain because if I'm a developer uh, writing up a server, then I obviously don't know the uh, listening address offhand. Right. I have to write code to figure out uh, the IP address of the machine I'm executing on and then bind to it. So essentially, uh, the C library has this wildcard, and it's called in address any. And what it does is it will bind your listening socket to all the IP addresses that are present on your machine, right? So if, if, it, it, if it has multiple NICs, then all of the IP, address, uh, IP addresses will have the socket listening on them. Now, the crux of the issue is that on Windows by default, you can have more than one socket listening on the same port, right? So I, I'm going to kind of uh, jump to the next slide, right? So here's your typical uh, setup, right? Uh, the server starts up, the server uses the in address any flag when it sets up the socket, because it, it provides a great abstraction to the developer. Uh, the developer doesn't need to write code to figure out what's my underlying IP. If he says in address any, then that's it. Uh, the socket's going to be listening on all IP addresses. If he specifies the port and the server is listening. Uh, the client obviously needs to know the server's IP and it uses that, connects to the uh, server, and that's it, right? It's all set up, you, and they can start communicating. Now, here's what happens in socket hijacking. So you have the server come up, 
uh, it starts on unit address any and the specific port and now it's listening for inbound communications or connections from the client right now you have this malicious application right which also starts up on the same server right it uses the same port to listen on but instead of using in address any it's going to use the specific ip right so 172 23 20 110 in this example right now you would think at this point the uh, os or the socket library should return an error because essentially you have two applications or two sockets binding to the same port but on windows this isn't the case right by default both the applications are running both the sockets are listening and they are all, both listening on the same port right now your client starts up uh, the client obviously uses the ip to connect to the server right now when it initiates the connection uh, the connection goes to the server and you essentially now have this conflict right uh, the server socket library gets the connection sees it's going to the port uh, 2000 for example right and it has to decide whom to forward the connection right because there's a conflict here there are multiple sockets waiting on the same port so there's a conflict and the socket library needs to resolve this so the way it will resolve it is it will resolve it in the favor of the socket which is more specifically bound so if my incoming connection is for 172 23 20 100 and i have two sockets on the same port one specifically bound to this ip which is 172 20 23 ip and the other in address any the socket library will resolve it in the favor of 172 23 socket right so essentially what will happen is this other application uh, which is malicious will get the connection right so at this point what you have is a essentially what you have done is set up a spoof server right the spoof server is running on the same machine right but in no way have you injected the client or you have tampered the client the client is still using the same sockets ip address port that it would connect to but the malicious server now gets the connection right so at this point it's a, you have set up a spoof server uh, depending on the uh, transport uh, protections uh, you could do a man in the middle you could do eavesdropping uh, but at the very least there is at least a denial of service right if the malicious application gets the connection and just lives with it or just drops it all your legitimate clients will, are never going to get serviced so at the very least it's a denial of service and then depending on uh, what you have you could do a man in the middle right now so i guess we spoke about the impact now to exploit this right an attacker at least needs uh, i guess execute privileges on the server right the attacker doesn't need to have elevated privileges uh, but he at least needs to be able to connect to the system and run code on it uh, out of the box configuration only affects windows uh, and uh, on i guess uh, Windows XP service pack 2 and later is more of the Unix way in terms of that ports 0 to 1023 are privileged ports. So if you had to hijack uh, those ports, then you already need to have admin privileges for them. Uh, so those are kind of some of the mitigations uh, present. Uh, in terms of recommendation, uh, when you bind, like when you write your uh, listening server, uh, you want as far as possible to bind to a specific IP address, but it's not always possible because you typically don't know uh, which IP address to use if the underlying machine has multiple NICs. So uh, a more uh, feasible option is typically uh, the socket option exclusive address use. And if you essentially use this, uh, the socket library on Windows won't allow multiple sockets on, on the same port and identifying the issues uh, at a code level you want to uh, try and search your code base for the api's bind uh, set socket options uh, to see if uh, it could be an issue for you uh, at a feature level essentially if you have a client server application communicating using sockets uh, then it could be a uh, issue for you so that's kind of the uh, socket hijacking uh, the other part of this uh, is unnamed pipe hijacking and it's similar to sockets uh, 
Essentially, name pipes are another uh, inter-process communication primitive, similar to sockets, right? Sockets are more widely used, uh, but name pipes are uh, fairly uh, widely used as well. Uh, they also allow you to co communicate between processes running on different machines, uh, bi-directional uh, communication. Uh, typically, though, name pipes are used uh, to communicate between processes running on the same machine. Uh, but, I mean, you could have named pipes to communicate on, across machines. One thing uh, named pipes that can do on Windows uh, is, uh, uh, is, I guess, a fairly uh, important security attribute that sockets can do is on named pipes, a server named pipe can impersonate the client named pipe without needing the credentials. So a, served, uh, a, a server named pipe can say, hey, run in the context of the client and the client doesn't have to pass the credentials. So it's completely seamless. Uh, so in most cases, name pipes are used when you have a scenario where you want to write a server, uh, a background server, right? So it's a Windows service or a Unix daemon, and you don't want to run it as root, right? Because if you have your service running as root, and if there was an exploit or there was a vulnerability in that, then essentially, that, uh, that would compromise the whole box. So you want to write the service, not run it with uh, root privileges, so in line with the least privileged principle. Uh, so you write it with a guest account or a limited rights account. But then you want to serve the client requests with the client privileges to make sure uh, your application works, right? So typically what happens is you have the server configured as a limited rights user service, and if the client connects, the server will impersonate the client. And this impersonation doesn't need any credentials. This is completely seamless, right? So the client connects, the server impersonates the client, and then the server essentially uh, processes the server client's request in the client's context, right? Uh, so typically, that's the scenario where neon pipes are used. And the, the impersonation privilege is the main reason why uh, a lot of time named pipes are used instead of sockets. So let's, let's look at the issue here. So unlike sockets, named pipes are identified by a name, right? The name is just a string. So when you have your uh, server startup, it essentially says, hey, create a named pipe of this name and listen to incoming connections. The client uses the same name, uh, the machine slash uh, named pipe name, and it gets the connection uh, once the connection is set up, they can uh, go ahead and uh, communicate. Uh, also, unlike sockets, named pipes are completely securable objects. So with named pipes, you can essentially say that only administrators should be able to connect to this named pipe, or only guest users should be able to connect to the named pipes. So named pipes, you can completely secure them, who can read to, from them, who can write to them, who can connect to them. So there are a couple of problems here. So let's see the first thing. And so this is similar to the socket hijacking thing. So essentially you have this uh, malicious application startup. Uh, it, it essentially creates a name pipe with the same name, right? So it's now listening. Now you have the server application startup and the legitimate server also essentially says, hey, create me a name pipe of this name test and listen on it. Now, again, you would expect the OS to say, all right, we, there is already a name pipe with, with this name, so return an error. But that does not happen, right? Uh, the OS, what it does is, instead of returning an error, will just return a handle to the existing name pipe, right? So the real server thinks that maybe it created the name pipe, but instead, it isn't the case. The other thing what happens is, if the server, when it creates a name pipe, says that uh, create a name pipe with this name and make sure that you apply the security actual so that only administrators can connect and read and write from it, right? If, uh, if the server essentially does that and if the name pipe was already created by the malicious application, the OS completely ignores the security attributes. So the OS just returns it the existing handle and completely ignores the uh, security attributes, right? So now you have your client, right? The client starts up, again, it's going to use the same name. And when it uses the same name to connect to the name pipe, 
because the malicious uh, application started the name pipe server before, it will get the connection, right? So it's similar to socket hijacking. Uh, essentially, what you have done at this point is set up a spoof server, right? Your malicious application gets the connection. Uh, at the very least, it's a denial of service, and then depending on uh, the transport uh, protection mechanisms, you could maybe do eavesdropping, you could maybe do ma man in the middle, right? So similar to socket hijacking. However, one thing that you can do here is, uh, remember I was talking about the impersonation thing. The, the malicious application now can impersonate the client without the client's knowledge. So in addition to the typical uh, spoof server scenario here, the malicious application can run with the client's privileges. So if the client was running with elevated privileges like admin or root, your malicious application is now root because that impersonation is completely seamless. Uh, the server doesn't have to request the client, hey, I want to impersonate you, uh, send me your credentials, nothing like that. It's completely uh, uh, seamless. So as compared to the socket hijacking scenario, that's an ad additional impact here, that there could be a privilege escalation attack here. Uh, the other insecure configuration, I, th I think I already touched on that. Uh, the OS will completely ignore the security uh, descriptor. So in terms of uh, what the attacker needs to exploit this, uh, again, first and foremost, like socket hijacking, uh, the attacker needs to be able to run code on the server, right? The malicious code needs to execute on the server. So he needs to ha have an avenue to do that. Uh, also on uh, Windows 2000 Service Pack 4 and later Windows XP Service Pack 2 and later, and uh, Windows, Service, uh, Windows Server 2003, uh, there is a, a SD impersonate privilege that the server needs so that it can impersonate the client. And by default, that's only granted to the admin uh, group. Uh, in, uh, so it kind of uh, gives uh, some mitigation against the privilege escalation attack. Uh, in terms of the remediation, uh, you want to make sure that when you create your name pipe, you only create it if it did not already exist. Because if it already exists, then you're not really creating it. You're just getting a handle to the existing one, All right? Uh, and uh, from a client point of view, if you have a client server application using name pipes and your application doesn't use the impersonation uh, property of name pipes, then when you create the cl client side connection to name pipe, you can essentially say that, hey, connect to this named pipe server, but don't allow the server to impersonate me. So you can do a little bit of damage control there. Like if you are using named pipes, don't need impersonation, uh, then you can turn it off. Uh, identifying issues, if you are using named pipes, then potentially this could be an issue. And as I was speaking earlier, right, typically where it is used is where you have a service uh, running in a limited rights user context and then uh, impersonating a client to uh, 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 serve its request. At an API level, uh, if you want to look in your code, uh, you want to look for a create name pipes, create file, uh, and impersonate name pipe client APIs. All right. uh, mutexes and events, right? So these are your uh, inter-process uh, synchronization privileges. Mutex is essentially your, uh, sh your uh, primitive which uh, allows you to protect uh, modifications or access to a shared resource, right? So an example, a good example would be uh, if you have a banking application uh, and which does transactions, uh, you want to make sure that every transaction updates the database uh, exclusively, right? Because you have multiple tra transactions going through, you don't want the uh, balances to be uh, corrupted. So you want only one transaction to update the database at the same time. So how do you do it? You kind of use a mutex or a, another uh, inter-process synchronization or primitive, right? Events are typically used to signal an event. So events, one of the most common architectures where events are used, where you have a worker process and a monitor process, and all the monitor process is supposed to do is start the worker process if it somehow exited or uh, shut down the monitor, pro uh, shut down the worker process as and when needed, right? So typically they would use events. So again, uh, as with the name pipes, 
uh, these objects are also completely securable. So can you, when you create your mutex or event, you can essentially say, hey, uh, only administrators should be able to lock it, unlock it, signal it, reset it, right? Uh, similar issues here also, like if you try to create a mutex or an event, which are again identified by a name, which is just a string, uh, if, you, uh, if you did not use the, uh, if it already existed, the, the OS is not going to return an error, right? It will, it will return you the handle to the existing one. Uh, and the other thing, uh, again, as in name pipes, it will completely ignore your security attributes that you specified. So the impact, again, depends on what you're doing with the uh, object. So like in the banking example, if uh, a malicious piece of code locked the mutex and did not release it, essentially it's a denial of service, right? Because your legitimate banking application will never get hold of the mutex and then never be able to update the database. Uh, privilege escalation, this depends, but uh, from where we have seen this happen is essentially the monitor worker process, where if, if a malicious process can signal a particular event, uh, the monitor will listen and shut down the worker. So things of that nature. Again, to exploit this, you, an attacker needs to be able to run code on the uh, server uh, so that he can change the state of the uh, uh, object. And then recommendations, when you create a mutex or the uh, object, then you want to make sure that it did not exist and then apply your security uh, uh, primitive uh, attributes to it. Uh, we kind of talked uh, the typical applications where you can see these issues. And then at a feature level, you, you want to look at create mutex or create event, uh, wait for single object, those APIs. All right, so going to the next kind of category, essentially uh, involved with, uh, security issues with creating new processes. Uh, so most commonly, right, where products or applications expose this uh, functionality such as scheduled tasks, most times they will have this uh, uh, additional functionality that you can choose a process to run if the task succeeded or if the task failed, right? So the user goes into the product, selects the task, selects the time when he or she wants to execute it, and then selects an executable that it wants to execute if the job succeeded or failed, right? Uh, so a few issues here, right? So first of all, in, mo mo in most cases, what can happen is the scheduled tasks run at a different time, right, at your scheduled time. So at that time, they typically end up running with the local system privileges, which is how the Windows service is configured, or root if your daemon is a set UID daemon, set, your, set UID root daemon. So if that's the case, then essentially what is going to happen is your uh, post-task execution will also run as root or uh, local system, which is the most powerful account on Windows uh, and will result in a direct privilege escalation. The other thing what we have seen applications do is uh, because they have uh, the task execute or the process executing with higher privileges, uh, they have a certain white list of processes uh, that the user can choose. Now, depending on how you execute it, it still could be vulnerable. Like for example, on Windows, if you uh, essentially have a C colon program files, uh, software, myprogram.exe, right? If you don't essentially launch it securely, uh, what Windows will do is it will first look for the white space in your executable path name, right? So C colon program, and then there's a space and then files, right? So if it found a C colon program.exe, it will launch it and pass the remaining files, software, myprogram.exe as an argument to c colon program.exe. So you, you can in, like, you will essentially launch a different process, c colon program.exe, which might be malicious, instead of c colon program files, software, myprogram.exe. So that's kind of typically used to get around the whitelist validation. Uh, so, so the impact there really is privilege escalation. Uh, and I mean, uh, explo exploitation mitigations, you kind of need local access so that you can copy the malicious file. Or, I mean, you can, if, if you know a like a powerful program, you can just run that. 
uh, instead of copying it. Uh, so the recommendation there is to uh, kind of launch the new process with appropriate privileges. Uh, so instead of launching the new process as root or uh, local system, uh, use the right uh, user to launch it. And then launch it securely so that you don't launch c colon program.exe instead of uh, uh, the c colon program files uh, application. Uh, identifying the issue at a feature level, if you, as I said, right, the most uh, common example is where you have your application has a scheduled task feature which allows you to uh, run post execution files. Uh, that's at a feature level, that's one example. At an API level, it's kind of create process, create process as user APIs. If you want to look at in your code, uh, then those are your APIs. All right, so moving on to uh, cryptography. Uh, so uh, the first one in cryptography is uh, your uh, insecure cipher mode. Now cipher mode isn't exactly your uh, the cipher. Cipher mode is one step above the actual cipher and it essentially determines how your cipher works, right? So for example, uh, in block cipher, uh, you, what it essentially does is breaks down your input into blocks and then encrypts each block at a time, right? Uh, so we'll look at an example. So essentially electronic code book is this uh, very kind of primitive in uh, cipher mode, which is insecure. And, and the reason why it is insecure is because it can reveal patterns in your plain text. Uh, so I think I've kind of I have an example. Uh, so essentially here's your uh, applic client application and a server application. Uh, it's a payroll application and here's your user. Uh, what it does is it asks uh, the server, hey, get the salary details. Uh, the server sends the salary details, but then again, the server wants to prevent this from uh, eavesdropping or sniffing attacks. So it essentially sends you the ciphertext. Uh, the client application has the uh, necessary decryption key to decrypt it and kind of show the plain text corresponding to that, right? Now, here's the attack scenario. It's the same client server application. Here's your user. Uh, connects to it, asks for his salary details. Now, this malicious user is just sniffing on the wire, right? He sees the, uh, uh, he sees the encrypted text, right? So since the application doesn't send out clear text, right? But if you look at those both cipher texts, now it's same, right? Uh, if, the, if the attacker had known the uh, uh, cipher text in the first case, then he knows what, uh, it essentially means to in plain, uh, in plain text. So, so the idea here is that uh, in encrypt, uh, in electronic code book, the same plain text results in the same cipher text, right? So if I knew the plain text, then looking at the uh, cipher text, I know what the plain text is, right? So it's uh, the same plain text with the same key will always result in the same cipher text. So as an attacker, if I know that, hey, the plain text of $100,000 results in this cipher text. If I see that packet or that string anywhere on the wire, I know this is an encrypted version of $100,000. So it kind of, kind of gives away information uh, about the plain text. And so here's another uh, kind of uh, pictorial representation of the same, and this is from Wikipedia. So it's kind of your image, and then if you encrypt it using uh, electronic code book, it kind of still reveals uh, some patterns uh, in the plain text. Right. So again, I mean, to exploit this, you don't really need local access. Uh, but I mean, in terms of recommendation, you, you want to make sure you use a strong cipher mode, uh, such as uh, cipher block chaining. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, developers use strong algorithms, but then a weak cipher mode kind of uh, uh, weakens the uh, advantages of using a strong cipher. Uh, and identifying the issue uh, at a feature level, if you are using cryptography, symmetric blocks, uh, symmetric block ciphers, then potentially this could be a, a issue for you. The APIs kind of differ. If you're using the open SSL library, you have a different set of APIs. If you're using the uh, Windows uh, SDK, 
you have a different set of APIs. Uh, the next one is the uh, integrity or uh, checking. So this is uh, um, this is most commonly seen in uh, like today's uh, thick clients, right? Almost every thick client today has essentially this auto update feature, where when you launch the client, it will go uh, check if there is an update available, and if you say go ahead and install it, it will go ahead download the uh, update and install it, right? So a few issues here, right? Uh, so if there's a, if there's no uh, integrity checking, right? If the update is just being uh, downloaded of clear text, then potentially there's a man in the middle avenue there, right? Somebody could replace the update with a malicious file. Uh, it comes to the client, the client is going to install it. Uh, the machine is going to be compromised. Right? Uh, the other uh, kind of subtle issue is there. Uh, application does use hash or uh, signatures to verify the uh, integrity of the downloaded update, but it doesn't do it securely. So by that, what I mean is essentially uh, the client connects to the server and says, hey, is there an update? The server says yes, and the server sends the update, right? So the update goes in clear text, and then with that, uh, the server also sends the hash. The hash now, again, if it's in clear text, then an attacker has to go one step further, replace the update, and then replace the hash as well. Now when the client gets the update and the hash, if it verifies it, it will match, and uh, it would still be compromised. Uh, so I guess, the, I mean, you, you want to make sure you use hash or signatures uh, to prevent tampering of the update, uh, but you want to do it securely. So when you when you transmit your hash or your signature, make sure you do it securely, right? The most common uh, scenario is where uh, an application will download the uh, update over clear text, but the hash is only available over the SSL uh, kind of connection, so that it can't be tampered. And I mean, impact is again uh, mostly a compromise because you are essentially uh, installing a rogue uh, update on the client machine. Right, and I, I, I guess we already talked a little bit about the uh, recommendations. But as, as the client application, you want to make sure that before you apply the update, uh, you ensure that you have obtained it from the right source and it hasn't been tampered uh, before you update it. And most common scenarios where this could be an issue is your auto update, uh, check for update scenario. ActiveX controls. Now, ActiveX controls are kind of, uh, oh, I mean, they are being used less and less, but there are still quite a few ActiveX controls out there. Uh, essentially, I guess they allow you to uh, execute uh, code in the browser, but which is not running within the browser sandbox, right? So you can essentially run a Win32 application from a browser. Right, so that's the great benefit or the power that ActiveX control uh, uh, gives out. Uh, typically though, ActiveX controls are used to kind of, you know, provide a rich interface. So like, there are quite a few uh, applications which want to show a tree view or Windows Explorer view, right? And for that, they will write, a, write an ActiveX control. So a common example is your uh, document sharing application or a uh, uh, knowledge uh, tracking uh, software, uh, where you essentially have uh, drag and drop. So you draw, drag from your uh, local file system onto this ActiveX control, it will sync up with the server, right? So common example. Uh, however, the problem with ActiveX controls is, uh, is one, I mean, again, uh, it's a Win32 component, so uh, it doesn't execute in the browser sandbox. Uh, so there's a great deal of motiv motivation for uh, exploiting ActiveX controls. The one, uh, one uh, issue is repurposing. So let's say I, I have a document sharing application. I, I write up my ActiveX control, uh, which allows you to upload, download files, sync files between the client and the server. Now, my ActiveX control is supposed to be only executed from the, uh, from my web website, which is let's say my documentsharing.com. Now, the very nature of ActiveX controls 
there's nothing stopping a evil site, so myevilsite.com, from using that ActiveX control. Essentially, you have this HTML tag or JavaScript tag which will run the ActiveX control if it's installed, right? So if, if an attacker tricked the victim to go to a malicious site, right, and the victim, let's say, has this ActiveX control, the malicious site is going to execute it without the user's knowledge, right? Uh, because it's already installed. So one of the things that you can do to limit damage with ActiveX controls is tie it to your site, right? So let's say uh, you, you, you write an ActiveX control which is only supposed to be executed by your site. When you develop your ActiveX control, you can essentially say that this site should only be launched from mywebsite.com. Or you can essentially say this site should only be launched by any website in my trusted zones or any site in my intranet. So you can tie an ActiveX down. So that essentially limits the damage, right? Because if I have a very powerful ActiveX controls like uh, document sharing, a uh, file uploading, file downloading, if as an attacker I can get a victim to my site, then uh, I can use that ActiveX control to copy malicious files and compromise the victim's workstation or copy files off the victim's workstation. So uh, that's uh, one of the uh, issues there. Uh, initialization from untrusted sources are similar. Uh, scripting, uh, so you can turn off ActiveX control scripting, uh, but if your uh, ActiveX control is supposed to be accessed from a browser, you, in most cases you can't do it. Uh, this is typically a scenario where you write your ActiveX controls and then essentially through Visual Studio or another designer, you drag and drop on a form or on your uh, window. Then you could turn scripting off. Uh, the impact really depends on what the ActiveX control could do. Uh, so you could have a bunch of uh, different impacts there. Our recommendations, you want to sign your ActiveX control so that when the user launches it or downloads it, uh, he or she has the confidence that, hey, I am getting this ActiveX control uh, from where I'm supposed to. Site lock template is essentially uh, this template which allows you to tie ActiveX control to a site. Uh, and if you don't need, then don't mark it uh, safe for initialization. Uh, at an application level, again, if you are using ActiveX control, uh, then you're potentially vulnerable. All right, so third party components. So third party components, again, are a great way of uh, uh, rapid application development, right? Let's say I'm, I'm writing a product and I need the compression of feature or functionality uh, to save on bandwidth, right? Now I could write up my own compression routines or I could write my own implementation of the uh, uh, already existing routines or I could just get Zlib. Zlib has been around for a lot of time. Uh, it's been used very widely. I can just integrate it in my app and I have the compression functionality. So uh, your commercial off the shelf components are a fair, uh, fairly uh, uh, popular in that scenario. Now, the problem with this is uh, though, typically the way this process works is, let's say I'm in version one of my product and I need the compression functionality. I'm going to take the latest and the best Zlib version available today and going to integrate it. Now I am five versions down the line. I never had the need of uh, any more compression functionality. So my version five is, is still shipping with Zlib one. Now Zlib or any other third party component is like any other software, right? There are vulnerabilities published, the vendor patches them, right? However, if, if essentially because this uh, third party component uh, vulnerability is not followed, uh, your application keeps on being vulnerable, right? So you want to make sure that uh, someone on your team kind of subscribes to the advisories of these third party components that you are using. And if there is a vulnerability published, then uh, you essentially uh, research it. If it's applicable, then patch your product so that your product is not uh, vulnerable. So this is, this is not a direct kind of, uh, uh, this, is, this issue is not introduced in your application because of your coding or your design 
uh, per se, but because this third party library that you are using is vulnerable. Right. Open SSL and Zlib are like the most common libraries uh, that I've seen uh, in most applications keep on using them and uh, many times they are kind of outdated. And uh, finally, uh, the thick client applications, right? Now thick client applications are like typically if you have a server client which uh, uh, talks TCP, which does not talk HTTP, then you have to write your own client, right? If it talks HTTP, then you could use the browser, but otherwise you have to write up your thick client. Uh, typically, another scenario where thick clients are developed is because you want to uh, develop a richer UI, the web is just not enough, the browser is not enough, so you write up your own client. Now, the problem with thick client is, thick client really can become a thick client. So you can have things like uh, authorization checks all pushed to the client, right? So which menus to show, depending on the role of the user, they all get pushed to the client sometimes, right? And client, by the very nature of it, should not be trusted, right? Because client, you don't control the environment in which the client runs. An attacker might be able to reverse engineer it, modify it, uh, comment all your rule checks, and uh, you don't want that to happen. Another scenario with thick client, though, is a lot of thick clients, uh, even today, uh, uh, seem to need admin privileges to run. Now, that's a problem because uh, typically you don't want, network administrators don't want to give out admin privileges to everybody, right? If I, if I need admin privilege to run a client application, uh, then that's uh, probably going to need, in most uh, environments, a uh, network uh, administrator sign off saying that, hey, this guy has been given admin privileges. And a lot of times, it's also because the log file is stored in program files directory, or a registry key is in HK, like HK local machine, or I'm creating a listening socket on ports privileged port 0 to 1023, all which could be kind of tweaked around, right? Uh, so again, the impact, if you have authorization data validation checks in your client, uh, then that could be more serious. You could result in privilege escalation. Uh, uh, and the other impact with having admin privileges uh, necessary for thick clients is that if there was a vulnerability, uh, then your machine is going to be compromised because it's running as an admin. Uh, and then in terms of re uh, remediations, uh, you want to make sure that, uh, I guess, both of those issues are kind of resolved. So uh, storing your logs in user's document directory, if you set up a listening server uh, as, as part of your client, then use one of the higher ports uh, instead of privileged ports. Uh, and then I guess if you are using a thick client, then potentially uh, these could be a concern. Uh, these are some additional references. Uh, so that's pretty much all I had. Uh, any uh, questions, comments? All right, that's uh, pretty much it then. All right, thanks uh, for being here.